Great. Hi, guys. This is so exciting to be here first morning, only morning for Articulate, um, here with Linda of Dishcraft and John of Bear Robotics. And you've probably seen Penny zooming around, or if you haven't, make sure to check her out. But just quickly wanted to give these guys a chance to tell us a little bit about what they're doing before we dive into the questions. So, John, you want to kick it off? Yeah, my name is John. Uh, I'm the founder of Bear Robotics. Uh, we are working on automating the front of house of the restaurant um, uh, by using autonomous robot called Penny. Uh, I used to be a restaurant owner, and then like when I do the serving, the real pain point is that my legs are tired, so I have to run like five to nine miles a day. I have to do that every day. It's really stressful, and um, I cannot really focus on the customer service. So we designed and built a robot. Um, to do the food running and also the busing, uh, taking dirty dishes back to the kitchen. Uh, and that worked out pretty well. Uh, our robots are uh, now is deployed in more locations, more venues, like including cafeterias, the casinos, and um, hopefully you'll see more pennies out there. Thank you. And I'm Linda I'm with Dishcraft Robotics. I'm the CEO. We started three years ago. We're still in stealth mode, but we are doing back of the house operations, so we pair really nicely with what uh, John is doing. And we did 200 hours of time motion studies to say what, where can we provide the most value and then start developing products from there. But stay tuned because we will uh, release sometime this year. Got it. And so uh, we've seen a lot of restaurant and food robotics since being in San Francisco. Um, you know, Penny, we have Sally, we have Cafe X outside. And sometimes a lot of the fun is just watching the robots do their thing. Almost as much fun and importance as actually like eating the food or drinking the drink. Is that something that you guys prioritize, like the, the fun user experience? Or is that something that you kind of are hoping will fade into the background and go unnoticed? Um, because it's just so convenient to automate all these different tasks. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, for us, the number one... Uh, Customers ask us all the time, we want, we want something that's functional and reliable, so that is our number one uh, priority is, is function and safety. Um, but we do like to have a little bit of fun because it is fun seeing a robot move. Yeah, um, at Bear Robotics we call, who is our CEO? Um, it's not me, our CEO, the C is uh, our restaurant customers. Restaurant customer needs to love the robot, otherwise people are not gonna adopt the robot. And the E is the employees. The restaurant employees are the person who operates the robot. They must get, feel like the robots are helping them, otherwise they're not going to use the robot. And they owe is the owner or the operators. They must get the benefit by adopting the robot. So all these three parties need to be satisfied so that this robot, the front of house robot, will be successful. And then of course, and the C part, they want to see like the fun and more cute more like uh, some, some characters, uh, some emotional feelings from the robot. Yeah, I, I think Penny is like, a lot of people have the reaction, she's so cute, you know, and it's like, but yeah. she's also just, uh, well, is she a she, first of all, who knows? And, you know, it's, it's a robot, but we yeah. imbue it with Let's this call it personality. It. <laughs> it's an it, yeah, we don't know the identity. Um, Great. Well, I, I'm really excited. I want to touch on this point that we talked about in our conversation, which seems to be a pain point for the entire food robotics industry, and that's scaling. Because right now we see some one-offs or two-offs of food robots, but in order for them to be adapted by, like, say, a fast food chain, are we going to see robots at McDonald's down the road? It's got to be able to scale efficiently and affordably. And I just want to hear from you guys how you're navigating that or planning to navigate that, how, how you think that needs to change for restaurant robotics to be really widely adopted. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think the overall, the restaurant industry is uh, very conservative and their decision making is slow. But we, we'll, we see that like um, early, early on, early days when the POS first appeared, the adoption was slow, but suddenly people realized that it, it truly helps with the operation, and then adoption uh, goes up very quickly. So I think um, showcasing a few restaurants and make sure that people can understand how to use the robot, and then I think the users will gonna explode. Got it, so first it's gotta be 
customers adapting, adopting, and liking it, and then yeah, and then the scaling will follow. Yeah, because it, it definitely helps with the industry. It meets well with uh, the industry's uh, need. So, but like they want to see it first before they adopt. Linda, any thoughts? Sure. So we find that there's a few uh, tech forward Halo customers, and we do think that in hospitality, people it's a very close knit group, and people know each other. So, uh, echoing what John said, you know, once you delight a few, our goal is that people love it so much that they tell everyone, "Oh, you must have, you know, you must adopt this." So, that's our goal. Got it. So it really seems like getting people on board is the first step yes. that we're working on. Seems like you have a lot of people that are going to be on board after this day, possibly. And make sure you guys are thinking of questions because we're going to open it up soon. I know we have a lot of smart people in the audience, so want to hear what you guys want to know from the from these two. But my next question is a little bit abstract, a little bit futurist, but I think you guys can handle it. Down the road, you you both are working, John, you're front of house, and Linda, you're working back of house. Do you foresee there being a fully automated restaurant experience, like no humans at all, um, full circle? Do you foresee that happening? And if so, how do you feel about it? Well, I mean, that really depends on the customer. Do you want to dine in at a, the factory, or do you want some human touch in the restaurant? I think um, our goal is to automate where... There's really no human touch needed. Like delivering food, you know, carrying dirty dishes, that's something machine can do better. But like taking orders, you know, interacting with the customers and make sure they're happy uh, with the dining experience. I think that's where uh, human touch is needed. Do we, like for some restaurant probably, that fully automated restaurant may uh, exist like like fast food that you just want to go in and eat and come out. But like the more upscale you go, the, the ratio of the human touch is more required. So I think it's a really matter of the choice from the market. Got it. But even the most upscale, you, you still think automation can play a part in, in making it easier both for the consumer and especially for the restaurant workers themselves. Yeah, they're already using like POS, right? So some 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 sort of automation, right? Yeah. So there will be some more adoption if if as long as they can conserve their uh, the concept. Yeah, I think that. Uh, so what's delightful about a restaurant is the customer touch and the uh, I mean, sorry, the service and the hospitality and the creative touch. I don't think robots are very good at tasting food, and so for upper you know, high-scale dining, it, it's just not a fit. But I think that there are many, many areas that can be automated, all the dull, dirty, dangerous tasks and all the areas where, like, you could provide data to help with, for example, menu planning. Um, that would be super useful. So it's, it's just a start. There's, there's no end of opportunity there. Yeah. yeah, it's all about finding the sweet spot where it's convenient but not soulless, maybe. Yeah. don't know. Want to open it up? Anybody have some thoughts, some questions? Yes, Cynthia. Hi. Um, so, for both of you, how did you decide how much of the problem space you wanted to tackle? So, I know in the case, you know, of a dish, how much of that sort of you know dishwashing did you want to do, and how did you think about that problem? And you know, similarly for John, you know, how did you decide like we're only going to do the between, but not the actual like final placement of the dishes on the table, et cetera. We did uh, 200 hours of time motion studies and said, where can we provide the most value? And we then tackled uh, what we thought was a constrained problem so that we could provide the most benefit. And so we just simply said, like, yeah, we, we just simply said, where can we provide the most value? And then tackled it that way. That we had a high confidence that the technology would work. Um. I wanted to provide a like um, platform for the front of a house uh, automation. Like the back of house requirement is quite fragmented market. Like I run a Korean restaurant and I can automate the tofu soup with robots, but I cannot sell it to McDonald's, right? Um, but like front of a house, as long as you're full full service, you got to take the order, you have to deliver the food, clean the dishes, and uh, do the payment. So once we have a good platform for that, then it's easy to scale up. So in terms of the business, I think that's a more, um, more better business opportunity for us. 
And yeah, we, we had a lot of discussion, like what's going to be the right spec of the robot for the front of a house. As I said, like the, the number one pain point is the logistics problem in the front of the house. So uh, solving logistics using the robot is, is the key point. But now do you want to have an arm there? Um, that, that raised some concerns, like um, in front of the very crowded and narrow environment, how can we make the arm safe? and then can do the pick and place. That's a very challenging problem as well. So um, is it really doable immediately? Probably not. Um, so we, we try to be as simple as possible that we can make the robot as cheap as possible so that we can deploy the robot more, that we can go from there. So that we decided as our first step. It's a good question. Oh, I think we have one in the back first and then we'll, we'll head to you. Yes. Three pieces of learning from your customer deployments because all of us have war stories to tell and I'm curious to learn from your war stories. And I'm sure we'll hear yours later as well. <laughs> I'm so sorry, to repeat that question, it was what are your top three uh, pieces what? of advice for deployment? Uh, top three pieces of learning. Top three pieces of learning for deployment. Or, you know, one or two. It doesn't have to be three. If they're not in the top of your head, but maybe don't go over three. That could be a lot. Um, so so the first of all, like our first prototype didn't look as cute as the current one. And it was like wires sticking on. I was really worried to run it at my restaurant. Like what if customers are scared and doesn't come back, then my restaurant business is going to collapse. But surprisingly, like everybody loved uh, the, to see the robot in the restaurant, like from the kids to the old people. So. I, I realized that, yeah, it's, the time is right. It's the right time to start the robot in the restaurant. Um, the second thing that I learned is the actual tip rate goes up. That, that's the, uh, the fun part. It's not just for, from my restaurant. We run at Amici's Pizza down in Mountain View. They, the servers say their tip rate has gone up. That's because their time is more freed up. They can s provide the better service to the customer. And then customers feel like they get a better service, though so they pay more tip. So that's another counterintuitive thing. And another thing is that like as a as an engineer, we count the success as how many deliveries and utilization, but like employees value more on just carrying heavy items. So it's it's less about efficiency, it's more about helping with the hard work. So just one busing delivery. Uh, they value it better than like two, three food deliveries. Interesting. Linda, any any well, learnings, insights? We're, we're still in stuff. That you're mode, able so, to share. So, um, uh, I mean, I would say that kitchens, I mean, I myself started to work in kitchens to understand the problem better. And kitchens are very messy, chaotic places. Um, and so having robots work in that environment was definitely a, a learning. Because actually, the uh, people are so interested in the robot that they, they want to hug it or they want to kiss it or they want to like, they're just grateful. They're so interested. They want to be around it all the time and uh, because it's solving something and they're curious. And so we want to be in the background, not necessarily in the foreground. Um, so that's been interesting for us. Like how, how do you solve the problem while giving a little bit of delight without, uh, without being a distraction? Yeah, that's, that's a hard balance to strike, I imagine, but great one. Um, yes, up front. Yeah, so I have two questions. First, um, you mentioned mostly operating in restaurants, front of the house, back of the house. How do you imagine, if you do, how do you imagine scaling outdoors to outdoors events? Because uh, from then you're talking different logistics. You're talking bringing the robots on site, take them, you know, back home, and then um, you know having it uh, potential operate on different surfaces, different environments, different obstacles, something entirely different than what traditional robots operate on now. So just to summarize, the question is how do, so we have front of house and back of house focus here. How do you apply that and scale that to larger outdoors events? To outdoors events, yeah. Like so, catering, is that what we're uh, talking yeah. about? Okay, cool, interesting. Catering conventions. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our first development, and we wanted it to be mobile, and so we uh, think a food truck, you know, just as a food truck can have back of the house and cook, you know, we can apply in any mobile location. Um, it would require to deploy like a millions of robots before we can go outdoor. There are like so many uses model just for indoor delivery 
and in the restaurant and like nearby uh, venues like uh, nursing homes or casinos. So we're we're fo we're gonna focus on the indoor f for the time being. Outdoor and indoor is quite different. So yeah, I think it's too early. <laughs> Great, and I think we have time for one, maybe two more. So let's grab a gentleman right there. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, what the customer is that's the early adopter for your technology. Is it a single restaurant? Is it a chain restaurant? Uh, like, what are the characteristics of your early adopter market? Um, it's actually the the various market as for the robot, like uh, like the big chains uh, and small mom and pops, as well as like cafeterias, events like hotel banquet. Um, like casinos, casino floors, you know, those all ask for the robot. It's the same robot that can be applied in on various uh, si situations. As long as you need to serve food, drinks, and have to, you know, do busing, then our robots can be there. As long as it's indoor. <laughs> and thoughts, early adopters, or maybe you can't say. Hey, yeah, I mean, we we. We like, just from a sales perspective, to go after, uh, it's an easier sale if they have multiple locations, but the robot itself is agnostic. You know, like I said, it, it can be mobile or it can be on site and it can work across whether it's a chain restaurant or a hotel banquet, it's, we're impartial to that. And then uh, one more question, yes, sweet green, sir. Got it. So just to rephrase, it's uh, asking about how you can work on maintaining the restaurant or the robots um, in chains that are maybe hundreds or even thousands of different locations and what you consider there. Repairs. We lease it, and so the service and support is included, but um, because we are very early, what we do is we're very geographically thoughtful in so that we know that we ha will have the people to support and so we'll you know we start in the bay area and then we have certain cities targeted after that and so we would not uh we would have a very bad customer experience i think if we said hey we're going to go wide open to a hundred thousand locations uh even though the demand is probably there uh so we just take a very uh slow approach so that we know that we can deliver customer delight yeah, um, it's, I think the uh, the operation side uh, has a higher overhead than the pure software, you know, startups. Um, I think uh, the more you, you got to raise more capital, uh, and you got to think about how to you know bootstrap a new the field op team on a new geographical locations. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very tough problem, and we I don't think we can claim that we solved the problem yet. Um, where we're working on it, um, probably next year we can tell more how we solve the problem. <laughs> and on that note of intrigue, we'll have to wrap up this panel. Thank you guys so much. This has been really interesting and, and really fun. Thank you.